This week, we had a special day. Uh, Valentine's Day was February 14th, and what a wonderful day Valentine's is, that we get to express our love and care for others. And uh, I don't really believe that. If I'm honest with you, um, I don't like Valentine's Day at all. At all. Um, there, there's things in life that, uh, you know, when you ask a three-year-old to sing a song that they just learned, but if there's people around, they just close up, they clam up it, and they won't do it. And moms and dads are always like, no, they really know it. You can sing it. You can do it. And, but uh, they don't like to perform for the moment. And I feel that, that way with Valentine's Day. Um, it's almost like we take our life together within our marriages or relationships. Somehow we kind of shelve them. And then we try to send this happy Valentine's Day card or go out on a Valentine uh, date. Almost ignoring the rest of the small moments of life. And, and we have this, this notion. Um, if I just get the big things right, you know, if we have that exotic vacation, if I get Valentine's Day right, it, and the reality is, in my marriage, I don't live Valentine to Valentine. Right? We live moment to moment. Think of how many times in your marriages, in your relationships, how much of your time is just spent on the mundane, the simple things. The things that you'll forget. The unnoticeable moments. I mean, 90-something percent of my marriage is in those times. And every so often we have a glorious event, but it's the small things that make my marriage. And it's why I think Valentine's Day always frustrates me. It's like I'm forced to do something that I don't normally do, as if that's going to make a difference in my marriage. Uh some of the small things in my marriage seem far more important than those big things that we try to move from. Um, so, small things. Uh, yesterday, I had such a great time. Nick, thanks for inviting some of the old guys to your bachelor party. Uh, that was a load of fun to hang out with Nick and some of his 20-something friends. Um, and we ended up going snowshoeing up Parker Mountain. All these years I've lived here, I've never been up Parker's Mountain. Um, And when you go out with 20-somethings, it's never just a normal, like, all right, let's go and come back. Uh, Once you hit 40-something changes, you're like, okay, can we go and come back and just... Well, these guys are all like, hey, I brought some sleds. Sleds? I thought we were snowshoeing. Yeah, it's for the way down, and... So, we said, uh, hey, well, in the back of my truck, I happen to have a bunch of sleds too. And so, we all haul them up. And um, on the way down, just had, I think, the most fun I've had in a decade. Sliding down, screaming, laughing, kicking my asthma in from, from all of the laughter. And we finally get back to Turbo Cam, uh, where all the cars were. And uh, one of Nick's friends um, he stays, his car is parked right next to my truck. He had driven up with me. And almost everyone leaves, and he's still there with the stuff next to his car. And I think I was texting uh, some of my family, so uh, I wasn't in a, in a big rush. And finally I look over, and his name w- was Joel. And um, he looked at me, and I said, Joel, are you all set? No, I can't find my keys. So I had this little conversation with Joel. Um, His apartment keys were on there. His car keys were on there. He's newly married. He got married seven weeks ago, I think. Um, His wife was out in Ohio visiting friends. And so his mind is turning. What do I do? So I stayed there with Joel. We looked all through my truck, kind of peeked in his windows, And, of course, in the back of our minds, you can guess these keys are up in a foot and a half of snow from sledding down that silly mountain. But 
uh, neither of us wanted to, to say what we both knew, they're gone, right? And uh, I don't know how you're going to solve this, but you're old enough, you can solve it. But uh, out, of my, out of my mouth comes, if you want, I'll drive you back to Parker Mountain, Joel. And uh, he says, well, I mean, it's kind of useless, right? But I'm willing. And so we travel back up, and I had the moment, guys. Speaking of small things, is losing your keys a small thing in life? I mean, we can think it's not, but, man, it is. Keys can be replaced. They're not a big deal. Feels big, but what a small little thing. So on the way back up to Parker, um, Joel is next to me. And I'm like, inside, you've been there, I'm sure. I'm like, I'm a pastor, I I should be praying about this. Like, I'm wrestling with this. God, should I verbalize a prayer that's going... And finally, I was like, all right, whatever, here we go. Hey, Joel, sometimes Jesus even helps us find lost keys. And uh, Joel looks at me, and he says something to the effect of, I know, but sometimes he doesn't. (laughs) And we literally ride in silence from then to Park Mountain. Get there, and uh, like I don't know how you're going to answer this, God, but I, however, you know. And Joel gets out, and I said, Joel, I'd go up the trail with you, but I'll just slow you down. So I'll wait here until you get back. And uh, thirty seconds later, a couple comes down off this trail. I think we'd seen four people all day, right? So two people come down and they say, oh, are you with the young man who's running up the mountain? Yeah, I am. Oh, because we found his keys and we put them on. um, There's a little sign thing. So he should be back in about two minutes. And I'm sitting in my truck, astounded that this just happened. And uh, Joel gets back, sure enough, and there's a huge smile on his face. And uh, as we're riding back, I'm like, Joel, isn't it amazing to you that God cares about these little moments? The God who created. The God who holds the stars in his hand. The God who knows each of us by name and the number of hairs on our head. Care, but he lost his keys. That's amazing. And uh, in our marriages, here's it's just a truth. Your little moments in marriage, waking up, traveling somewhere, sharing breakfast together, sitting on a couch, coming to church, those little moments, I think are where all the difference is made in marriage. It's not the big things, it's the small things through life. Um, And and sometimes we ask ourselves, you know, why do we do the things we do in marriage? And the response, typically in my mind, is, well, Esther, my wife, kind of makes me feel certain ways and makes me do certain things and for others, maybe if your marriage is in trouble, that, that's an altogether clear thing. My husband is this way, and it makes me angry. It, it drives me to flirt. It, it's because my husband ignores me. It's because my, my wife is not this, that I do these things. I hear it often. I experience it often. It kind of goes like this in other circumstances. I mean, what do you do in traffic when someone cuts you off and they don't gain any time? Uh, Yeah, right? Steam. For some of us, if we don't have great self-control, it may be some bodily motions that just happen in the car. And we think, man, that, that guy, he was so rude. I just responded. Or maybe, 
Maybe work is so stressful that I just needed to vent and I gossip about my boss. Well, the waitress spilled wine, but the, it was my new dress. It, it was no wonder that I reacted the way I did. And here's a life-changing truth I want to share with you this morning. I hope you can hear it. I hope you can believe it. Here it is. Circumstances just press out what was already in our hearts. I want you to feel the weight of that for a moment. Circumstances just press out what was already in our hearts. It's like they greased the skids to let these things out. I was sharing a story with someone recently. Uh, the first time I was around someone who was drunk, uh, I was in high school, and I remember it well, like these people were acting really strange, and I mean, I wasn't naive, but I'd never just been personally around that environment. And uh, someone said something that night that um, I blew off. Like, well, they're drunk, right? They didn't mean that. Until later, I learned, no, uh, drunkenness just loosens the lip to expose what's already in the heart. Circumstances, just like alcohol, simply grease the skids to reveal what's already in our heart. All right? That's our platform this morning. Nothing comes out of our mouths that wasn't already in our hearts. Nothing comes out of my life that wasn't already lurking somewhere in my heart. Because the heart is our life's GPS. It determines how we act. It determines what we say. It's our heart that determines what direction in life we'll choose. It's like the global command center of our lives. And on one level... Our bodies simply carry out the mission that our heart gives it, right? Our bodies are like the functional end of what our heart is wanting. So it's no surprise that we read this. If we can put Proverbs up. A very wise man once said, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of of life. Above all else, it's your heart that matters. So I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 6 this morning. We're going to be in two different passages. As we hit week number two in our series, uh, Marriage, a Mess Worth Making. Luke chapter 6, verse 43. And then we'll slide over to Ephesians where we've been poking our way through. Luke chapter 6, verse 43. We'll, we'll read this whole section and then just try to digest it. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. So, uh... Jesus has this wonderful analogy for us because sometimes it's hard to understand a truth or it's hard to accept a truth. So the the truth that I gave you was that circumstances simply press out what was already in our heart. We can hear that, but sometimes it's a story, it's a picture that really helps us drive it home. And Jesus has this great analogy. He looks at trees around him, the fruit trees, the briars, the thorns, uh, the figs. And he connects our life, and for us, we're thinking our life and our relationships with a tree. And he has this deep wisdom 
that's simple and yet incredibly true. The fruit that comes off a tree is there because that's the kind of tree it is. Uh, I've shared about our ridiculous, pathetic little apple tree. I've shared different stories about that thing. Um, But you can picture some of the the wonderful farms around us. Um, When when I go apple picking, um, my little tree just produces little like hockey pucks that hang, and sometimes they're red, most of the time they're not. Uh, They're pretty miserable little apples. But when I go up to Butternut to pick apples, it's silly, right? How do I know where the apple trees are? Just look. Hey, there's apples hanging off that tree. That must mean it's an apple tree. It's not an apple tree because the farmer came around and stapled the apples up. It's not an apple tree because someone came and painted apples on the leaves. It's an apple tree simply because of the fact the root system and the trunk and the leaves were designed to produce apples. In fact, butternut has no chance whatsoever of producing raspberries from their apple trees. Because at the end of the day, it's the kind of tree that determines what the fruit is. Here's how we approach marriage. Rarely do we look at our root system, our heart. Rarely, when marriages are in trouble, do we have the humility and the ears to hear that it's not the fruit that's ultimately the issue. Because we have the fruit in our marriage because that's what's in our heart producing it. And so, uh, what... When I seek help, when people seek help from me, the most common desire is, can you change the fruit? Right? The fruit's bad. It's, it's hurtful. I'm being ignored. She's not paying attention. Um, she's not loving. He's not caring. Pastor, can you change the fruit? Or counselor, can you change the fruit out here? Because that's our ultimate desire. We want good fruit in our marriage, right? And the thought crosses our mind, if I can just change the fruit, the marriage is going to be good, and the marriage is going to be restored, and it's going to be joyful. But the real issue is, and where it's hard to go in settings, the real issue is not the fruit, it's the tree that's producing it. Which means it's a heart issue. And the good news is, you've got a God who deals with heart issues all the time. It's not a pastor that can change heart issues. It's not a spouse or a counselor that can change heart issues. You have a God who can change heart issues. We've been talking about putting off and putting on, recognizing the heart that God has renewed in us, that heart of flesh, that new heart, that wants to please Him in all areas of life. And last week, we looked at selfishness. Where we're driven by what I want rather than God's purposes. So with the fruit tree picture in the background, if you can turn to Ephesians chapter 4, Paul has some wonderfully life-giving advice for marriages, for relationships. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 25. Verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. A lot of marriages, I don't know that it's all, but certainly a lot, we have this tendency towards deceit. Tendency towards deceit where we'll manipulate the truth to get what we want out of the relationship. Um, 
try to be transparent with you as much as I can. One of the hardest points in my marriage came off one of the, the silliest um, things. And the uh, story goes like this. Um, I think it was early on when our church was embracing Advent differently and approaching Advent uh, differently. And uh, I looked at that and said, yeah, I want to learn to wait. Uh, I want to learn this new rhythm of approaching Christmas and never fully verbalize that to my wife. Kept it. Said, well, she'll buy in, family will buy in, and we'll be good. And then over a period of like two, three weeks, um, I kept hearing, uh, hey, our neighbor's going to go cut down a Christmas tree. Can we join them? To which I wouldn't answer. Hey, our neighbor's going to cut down a Christmas tree. Can we join them? Hey, neighbor. Finally, literally, the day arrives. Hey, uh, they're all ready to go, honey. Can we go? Which I looked and said, um, no, I thought we were going to wait this year. That one moment in my marriage um, exploded into a very significant conversation that my wife and I had about my tendency to hold back and manipulate on the back end. And uh, I share that with you because what I did and what had been a pattern in my marriage was deception. That I wouldn't want to forthrightly tell her something. I wouldn't want to just clearly articulate something truthful about what I'm thinking or feeling but rather to try to manipulate things and push things and in the background uh, make things happen without ever sharing. If you've ever hit a hard time in marriage, uh, you can duplicate that hard time and we went through it over that silly event over Christmas tree because what got exposed in me was a tendency towards deceit. Is withholding information deceit, right? Ladies, is not describing the fullness of the credit card at Kohl's deceit. Guys, it is holding back what we really think and feel in a moment to just wash it. Is it deceit? It is. It is. And I think a lot of marriages have this tendency towards manipulating the truth to get what we want out of the relationship. And so Paul says, to put off falsehood. Stop adjusting how much we say. Stop trying to paint a different picture. The word for falsehood is a pseudos, which is, that's an interesting prefix, right? It's false. It's like a pseudonym is a different name. It's not really my name. It's a different one. Or pseudoscience is some sort of made up, a wacky science. <clears throat> and Paul says to put off this pretending, put off this pseudos, put off the falsehood. And in our relationships, embrace truth, reality. Why? I love the end of this verse. For we are all members of one body. In a marriage, your spouse is not your enemy. Your spouse is not an enemy. Your spouse is not placed there to be opposed to you. When we start embracing (coughs) our own view of marriages, it can be so true that our view is, well, my spouse is my enemy. They're always opposed to me. They're always standing in opposition to me. And we lose the basic view that God has given us that no, your spouse is united to you in one flesh. Your spouse is your partner. Your spouse is your God-given complement. Your spouse is there because God has chosen to put them there. And when we start to view our spouse as our enemy, 
man, we start to deceive and hold and manipulate. But when we start seeing, no, we're part of the same body. No, my spouse, even if it's difficult, God has given them to me to complete the picture of Jesus and the church. And all of a sudden, I'm open to speaking truth in love. There's no need to be false, to be untrue. It's not that we're truth bombing, but with grace and love to be truthful. Can I just say I am thankful? This gets back to small moments. Is a Christmas tree cutting it down a small moment? Yes, it is. And I am so thankful that my God in heaven cares about my small moments. Enough to expose my heart in a place that needed repentance. And I'm thankful that God gave me a heart that was able to receive the need to repent. Which is how that story cycled. There was a tough week or two in the Littlefield house. Until, I need time. Uh, Esther, she's Puerto Rican, she moves quick. She's like there and then... Uh, but she also moves quick uh, to resolution, too. And uh, she leaves this lingering husband like, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm still hurting here. I, I, I'm not. This. took me a, a long time. Um, but I'm thankful that in the little moments, God pressed something out of my heart that was able to be repented of and restored and healed. And uh, I know it's a heart change because I forget how many years ago that was, but it's been a lot of years that I've been much more truthful, much more open, much more loving in marriage. He moves on. First one, a tendency towards deceit. And then in marriage, boy, we have a tendency towards anger. Verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. It goes like this. I want to control the relationship by venting my anger or by holding it over you to control you. Is anger bad? No, right? Uh, How many of us get angry angry when we read the story in Foster's about a foster child that's being abused in their home. Yeah, right? Um, anger, anger is not wrong. Anger is not evil. Uh, if someone bullies your child at school, yeah, uh, there's rightful anger that should arise. Anger is not bad. In fact, I hope you get angry. Jesus did. Anger is a reaction. It's an emotion. And the reality is we can't control our emotions. If we could, I would vote a lot of us here would control our emotions. Um, I don't tend to have a load of emotions. um, But for those who do, man, I would vote that you control them. But you can't. Emotions are simply God's gift to us to react to what's going on around us. So if we're sad and someone comes along whistling and tells us uh, to not worry and just be happy, does it work? No. Because I don't have control of my emotions. I can't be devastated. Have someone come along and say, hey, Scott, you actually should be happy right now. I can't pick myself up and say, oh, okay, thanks. That was helpful. I'm good now. Our emotions are are simply what they are or what they aren't. Classic example. How many of you husbands have ever been watching a movie and you turn turn to your side, you see your wife crying and you think, oh, this part's sad. Like, <laughs> and 
and I try to, like, get, oh, come on, you can do it, push it, yes! <laughs> we, we simply can't control our emotions, they're the reactions that we have to the environment around us. And so here's, here's the danger that Paul is getting to. The danger in marriages is not the emotions, but what will come from the emotions. So one of the fruit of the Spirit that God gives is self-control. It's mentioned like 19 times. And every time it's mentioned, it's literally like this uh, e-brake that's going to spin your vehicle around. Self-control can take emotions and what we want to do from those emotions, and it's self-control that throws that e-brake up and says, but I will not make my decision off of that. Every time self-control is used, it's dealing with limiting the choices we make from our emotions. It's kind of like your wife's elbow. (laughs) Or that look across the dinner table. And Paul puts it out here. Specifically anger. Don't let it fester. Because anger will control. So he uses it this picture. Don't let the sun go down. Some of you have let many suns go down on your anger in your marriage. The reason I know that it controls you now is because you yourself describe your marriage or your role in your marriage as angry. I'm so angry. I'm so angry. After two sons, three sons, 30 sons, five years of sons go down, it no longer becomes an emotion, it becomes your identity from which you're making all of your choices. So you can't help but blame your spouse. You can't help but look out and say it's someone else's fault. You can't help but live your life out of this place of being angry. So Paul says, settle it quickly. Release it. Because if you don't, the devil gets a foothold. We don't use it. We're congregationalists. I mean, we don't use this phrase. Maybe uh, Pentecostal churches would. Uh, We see the verse here, the devil will get a foothold. We don't really use the phrase, the devil made me do it. Like, it's just not part of our verbiage. But we have the thought somewhere. You know what the devil getting a foothold simply means? That our enemy, the one who hates you, the enemy of Christ, gets a foot into your heart to pull out what's already there. It's not that the devil makes us do anything. He doesn't have that power. But I think specifically in anger, guys, if anger is not resolved, we open up to let our enemy, to let the devil pull out things that we're trying to hide in our hearts. I'll just tell you, every single time, that is devastating, painful, brutal. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let it become who you are. Verse 28, our last one. A tendency towards selfishness. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Tendency towards selfishness, which in marriage goes something like this. I want to protect what I have rather than offer it to serve you. Theft is horrible. Have any of you um, ever had your homes broken into? Holy smoke, seriously, wow. 
Um, we were just talking with someone this week who had that experience. I, I've never had that. I've had a car broken into and felt violated by that. Never had my home broken into. But I can only imagine the sense of unnervedness, the sense of, of just violation that someone came into your home and decided that what you have, they deserve. And they take. Uh, that's got to be a super disturbing moment. Because uh, on the victim side, it's your space, it's your bedroom, it's your jewelry, it, it's your stuff that someone else violated and claimed it as their own for whatever reason. They said they had a right to it when they didn't. It's a self-centered taking of what I want, justifying I deserve it to meet whatever need is there. And in marriage, we just substitute a few words. And one spouse comes home from work. And in our minds, we think we deserve something. I deserve to have my meal made by the time I get home. I deserve to have my needs taken care of. I deserve something better. I deserve less stress and less aggravation. I deserve to be treated better. I deserve, I deserve. We enter the cycle of taking for ourselves rather than sharing with our spouse. One of the hardest things for man, I imagine, for a woman too, one of the hardest things is for a man to come home after a hard day of work, tired, exhausted, and give more. Because we have that inner sense of, I just laid it out, I'm the one that earns the money, she's the one that fill in the blank, I've got my role, she's got hers. Come home from a hard day, and now I deserve a respite. And now I deserve a break, a nap, some food. I just want to say, you might deserve it. You might have worked really hard. You might be really tired walking in that door. That is not God's design for marriage. God's design for marriage is that we always be givers. Meaning, my workday is not done when I come home. My workday is half done when I come home. That God's expectation of me is to always be a giver. You say, well, how can you always be a giver? I'm not, right? I'm a failure too. I sin. But it doesn't make it right that I don't meet that expectation. God always wants a husband or a wife to be a giver. And that can be tedious, right? And so we hope. We hope that in that giving, at some point we receive. And that's a good hope. That's how marriage should work. I give and I give and I give, but man, glory to God, I receive, I receive, I receive. And that's called marriage. In a difficult marriage, it's the receiving part that gets cut off, and therefore I cut off my giving part, and now there's a chasm sitting in there between husband and wife where I want to demand something and take something, but so does she. And eventually we get into dire trouble. Here's the paradox of marriage. We will never find satisfaction in our marriage by seeking it. We will never find satisfaction in our marriage by seeking it. We find satisfaction in our marriage by giving it. I've been married uh, almost 19 years now. 
Uh, loads of you have more marriage years than I do. Some of you have fewer. I cannot recall any circumstance where by seeking satisfaction in marriage, we've gotten it. I can tell loads of testimonies that by seeking to give satisfaction, we've received it fully. It's a paradox. You can't aim for the thing you want to aim for. What do you do? You see God's view of marriage. And you give. And you submit to God's way. Because when does marriage become life-giving? When we put off our old selves, that selfish, grabbing, deceitful self, and put on the new that Christ has given us. Because Jesus has done something in our hearts that's changing the root system in us that eventually changes the fruit at the end of our branches. When we put off our old selves and put on the new, transformed hearts who know the grace of Jesus and who are willing to listen and obey His way of living. So those three areas that Paul addresses, let me just flip them. There's incredible life-changing power of truthfulness and love in your marriage. There's incredible healing benefits benefit of gentleness, patience, and love rather than acting out of anger. And many of us have experienced the joy of serving the needs of someone else rather than taking that position of trying to get and claim for ourselves. This is how much God loves us. He has given you, if you are married, He has given you the best opportunity He could ever design to practice for kingdom life. Isn't that a great gift? That God has given us the most intimate of relationships for a man and a woman to come together in marriage to be one flesh so that I get to practice the way I'm called to live for all of eternity. I love the the fact that God gives us that. Because He cares about all of your small moments. Those little moments that come each and every day. In soccer, um, you all know the the phrase, practice makes perfect. Uh, We flip that. I'm sure it's not original with us, but our coaches teach a different message. Practice doesn't make perfect. You remember what it is? Practice makes permanent. That's the verbiage we give to our kids. And as we embrace Jesus' way of living together, as we embrace that new self, searching for new roots, trusting God to do something in our hearts, here's the good news. There is a permanent life for us out there. And what we practice now is supposed to be a glimpse and a peek into that permanent, eternal kind of life. That's out there. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Toss them a lot. Wives, submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. It's not an easy task, but it is the life giving space within marriage. Uh, let me invite our worship team up as we close in prayer. God, I thank you for the ways that you interact with us. Thank you right now as your church is before your throne that you bend an ear and you listen to our prayers. God, I thank you that you're sovereign king and you're also savior friend. You are altogether amazing. And God, I pray in the marriages of this room, in the marriages yet to be from this room. But God, I pray that your name would be honored, that a picture of your grace and your love would erupt. God, may you 
by Your Spirit, tear down our stubbornness. May You help us to look towards the others as better than ourselves. Lord, the pain and the hurt that some of us have, God, may You give us courage to forgive and release and to embrace our new way, our new heart within our marriages. God, help us not to act out of our anger, seek our own reward or selfish gains, but rather to please you in all the things that we do. Lord, thank you for the great God that you are. In Jesus' name.